Well, how many of you heard fireworks already in your neighborhood uh, last night or Friday night? Yeah, my dogs loved it. Not really. We're starting to celebrate the birthday of our nation on this Tuesday, July 4th, 1776. We'll celebrate the 247th birthday of the United States of America. On July 4th, 1776, 56 men signed the Declaration of Independence. And as a result, the United States of America was formed. And this nation was and continues to be unique among all the nations of the world. It's unique because of all the freedoms that we have here. I mean, think about it. We have freedom of religion. We have freedom of the press. We have the right to assemble as we're doing today. We have freedom of speech. We have the right to bear arms. We have the freedom to vote and choose our own leaders. We have the freedom to choose our own destinies and to live our own lives. We have the freedom to do what we want with ourselves as long as we don't harm another person in the doing. Truly, we have been blessed to live in a wonderful nation, a nation filled with freedom. But what are we doing with this freedom that we enjoy in this great land of ours? And is there another type of freedom that most people miss out on? Another type of freedom, quite honestly, even more special than all the freedoms we celebrate in, as citizens of this great land? Those are the two questions we're going to answer this day. Today we talk about true freedom. So first of all, what are we doing with these freedoms we enjoy? What's interesting, I, I choose, I'm going to think in terms of my lifetime. I'm 64 years old, so 1960s on up. What has happened in my lifetime? Well, of course, there have been many advances. Uh, think of medicine. Man, the, uh, when I was first a pastor 36, seven years ago, um, Hip replacements, knee replacements, all that stuff is becoming commonplace at much shorter recovery time. You can think of heart technologies and surgeries they can do that they never used to be able to do. You know, there's so many advances in medicine and in pharmaceuticals. Um, more and more we're coming up with treatments for a lot of types of cancer. It's incredible, all the changes in medicine. Even more incredible is the changes in technology. When I was in high school, I took my first computer class. The computer that we had to use was about as big as the choir law section here. Um, we had punch cards that you had to type out and hand them to the computer operator, and you'd come back in an hour, and they'd give you punch cards as the back. In the language of Fortran, which is pretty well obsolete, um, which explains why I have so much trouble with computers. But you think about computer technology. You think about the cell phone that most of you carry around. I carry a smartphone, although I am not worthy of that title, smart. Um, but in that, in that phone that fits in my pocket is more technology than was in that computer that I learned to uh, work on. It's incredible, the changes. So we've had some good things happen. But what about people. How are we doing in the last 60-ish years? How are we doing with all the freedoms we enjoy? Well, there's been a lot of changes in the last 60 years. Most of it not that good. You can think in the 1960s with the uh, sexual revolution that continues to this day, by the way, and more and more and more people think there's nothing wrong with sex and marriage. You don't have to be married. Um, in fact, there's any form of sex seems to be okay now in our society. Uh, sexual immorality abounds. Pornography abounds. I remember when I was growing up, there was uh, certain bookstores that were dirty bookstores. And everybody would make comment if they saw your car in the dirty bookstore. So you didn't want to, you know, they'd have to have parking around back so no one would see your car there. Now you don't have to go to a dirty bookstore to get to look at pictures like that, do you? Where do you go? Your, your cell phone. You can go on your cell phone, your computer, any screen device. And the number one internet business is pornography. That tells you something about the changes that have taken place. Of course, drug abuse started in the 1960s. And boy, has it taken off. 
It's scary, all the different drugs that are so readily available on our streets and in our community. And sadly, uh, not everybody survives that craze for dr illegal drugs. I've done the funerals. You probably know some people too. And then in the 70s, well, abortion became legalized, Roe versus Wade. And to one degree or another, it's still legal in most states in the United States, uh, although with more restrictions since Roe versus Wade was overturned. 60 million babies have been killed. You know, that's the stuff that's been going on in our society. And we're becoming more isolated. Remember, social media was designed to bring us together. More and more, it's pulling us apart. And I've never seen more nastiness than I do on social media. If I post something that offends someone, I'm sorry, but there's some language I don't want to hear, you know. So that's what's been going on. So the question is, what are we doing with the freedoms that we've been blessed with as citizens of the United States of America? Well, our text tells the truth. We've been using our freedoms to indulge our sinful nature. We have used our freedoms as an excuse for evil. By and large, we've used the freedoms we've been blessed with here in the United States as an excuse for immorality and selfishness. We're free to do what we want, that's true, but mainly it seems like what we want is the problem. For we want to give in to sin. And let me be clear, that's not just a problem out there, outside the church walls. No, it's a problem in here, inside the church as well. For even among us, we have that same tendency to use our freedom as an excuse to indulge our sinful nature. And as a result, the immorality of the world so oftentimes shows up in our lives too. For example, sometimes we too allow sexual immorality to corrupt our lives. Sometimes we too like to look at those pictures on the internet. Sometimes we too allow cursing and vulgarities to pass through our lips. Sometimes too we're prone to drunkenness or drug abuse. Sometimes we too want to allow hatred and prejudice to fill our hearts. Sometimes we too want to ignore the needs of our family and ignore the needs of the church and ignore the needs of the hurting people around us. We just want to use our freedom for ourselves, not to help anyone else. And just think what this continual yielding to sin does to our Christian witness. Gandhi was greatly attracted to the teachings of Jesus Christ, but ultimately Gandhi rejected Christianity because of the way the Christians he actually knew in person lived their lives. Well, would people we know be attracted to Christianity by the way we're living our lives? Well, not if we're continually using freedom as a license for sin. Or just think for a moment what our sin must do to our Heavenly Father. How must he feel when we keep on indulging our sinful nature and giving in to evil? Think of how disappointed he must be with the sin that we allow to remain in our life for day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. I mean, there's no doubt about what we deserve from our sin against God and his holy word. We deserve his anger. We deserve his wrath. We deserve punishment. We deserve condemnation. But the amazing thing is God doesn't give us what we deserve. Instead, he gave us his son. Instead, God nailed his one and only son to the cross so that through his innocent suffering and death there, the debt of our sins could be paid for in full and we could be forgiven for all our sins. Because of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, God now forgives all the times that we used our freedom as an excuse to indulge our sinful nature. Because of Jesus Christ, we are truly and totally forgiven. And all who look to Jesus Christ in faith truly can be assured that they are children of God and can look forward to spending eternity with him in heaven. What a wonderful God we have. But along with the forgiveness of our sins in Christ Jesus, we're also given something else. We're also given the true freedom that is talked about in our text for today. You see, real freedom has to do with the freedom to serve one another in love. Or as Peter tells us, real freedom has to do with living as servants of Christ. 
You see, anyone can live for sin. It comes easy to us, what with our sinful nature. Anyone can use freedom as an excuse to engage in immorality. Anyone can live a life filled with selfishness and sin. But only Christians can live as servants of God. Only Christians have the freedom and the ability to overcome the sinful nature. Only Christians have the freedom to truly love one another and live for each other and serve each other. For it is only in Christ that we begin to understand what true freedom is all about. I mean, think about it. Jesus was absolutely free. I mean, he could do whatever he wanted to. After all, he's God. No one could force him to do anything against his will. He could do whatever he wanted. But he did not use his freedom for sin or for selfishness. Instead, he freely chose to serve us in love and even to be nailed to a cross for us, for the forgiveness of sins. You see, that's what true freedom is all about. True freedom is the ability to say no to sin and yes to loving and caring for others. True freedom is the ability to overcome selfishness and to begin to live for others. And once we come to know the love of Jesus Christ, once we understand how much he loved us, so much that he was willing to give up his life for us on the cross, once we truly realize that he used his freedom to die for us, well, that's when we get set free. And that's when we can begin to love and serve others. As we gaze at Jesus dying for us on his cross, as we recall how he used his life and even his death for us, that's when we are transformed into people who really will love and serve and help each other in imitation of Christ. Christ then sets us free to truly live for our families and to put their needs ahead of our own. And Christ sets us free to become true caregivers for the sick and the infirm and the ill around us, never counting the cost, but just doing what needs to be done to help. And Christ is the one who sets us free to dedicate ourselves to the work of his kingdom and to quickly volunteer to serve in any way we are capable of. And Christ sets us free to invest ourselves in helping with the needy in our community, working with hospice or Meals on Wheels or Habitat for Humanity or the local soup kitchen or even helping here with our Building Bridges program or our sharing center. Christ sets us free to focus not just on self, but on others, and to get out there and visit the lonely and the widows and the shut-ins and those hospitalized or in nursing homes. Christ sets us free to no longer live just for sin and for self, but to truly live a life that makes a difference in the lives of others and for God's kingdom. And if you want an example of a person who is set free from sin and selfishness to live for others, well, to me, the perfect example is the life of Mother Teresa. In the love of Christ, she truly was transformed into a person who used her life to help the poor and the needy and the rejected people of the world. People always wonder how she could possibly have devoted her life to working with people with leprosy and AIDS and all kinds of other great needs. But you now know the answer. She had been set free by the love of Jesus Christ. That's how she could do that. And Jesus Christ is here today, my friends, to set us free today, too. So put yourself last after the needs of your family. Look upon the sick and needy as a call into action. That prayer list we have each Sunday, maybe that's your call into action. Look at the bulletin announcement seeking volunteers as an opportunity for you to put your freedom to good use. Use your freedom in Christ not to indulge your sinful nature, but to serve one another in love. Use your freedom not for evil, but to serve God and his kingdom. Christ gives us that kind of freedom today. And you know what? As we begin to use this freedom we have in Christ Jesus, this freedom for God and our neighbor, everyone ends up blessed. We'll be blessed with good feelings inside of purpose and value. God's kingdom will be blessed with growth because others will see in our lives the reality of God's love and our country will be blessed too. And on this 4th of July, it's important for us to stop and think about how our country will be blessed if we use our freedom in Christ to serve God and the people around us. 
You see, democracy will only work when the citizens of that democracy use their freedom to serve God and their country and each other. Democracy fails when people use freedom as a license to sin. Daniel Webster once said, whatever makes men good Christians makes them good citizens. And he is right. Christianity is the key to democracy. In fact, John Adams, who was the president when St. John's was started in 1798, this is what he said. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. If we want our government to work, if we want our democracy to work, we know the solution. Christianity is the solution. So if we want our nation to be a great nation, we've got to use our freedom in Christ to serve one another and to just keep working on making this world a better place. We are the key for a democracy that works. And Christ is the key to equip us to live out this true freedom. My friends, may the love of Jesus Christ then truly touch our hearts this day and transform our lives so that we can live for Jesus and gladly serve each other in love. In his precious name, amen.